I want to talk to you about one of the craziest, most dangerous, exciting, and rewarding jobs in the world. It's not very well paid, even if sometimes you risk your life doing it. But what you'll see, you'll see the worst and the most beautiful sides of mankind. You'll see history unfolding in front of your eyes. It's the job of a war correspondent. And once upon a time, I was a war correspondent, more specifically, a freelance war reporter. It shaped me. It completely changed the way I saw the world. It all started in 1990 when a journalist friend of mine, Justin Burke, suggested going to Russia. Russia at the time was called the Soviet Union, and it was our enemy. It was this strange and vast and mysterious empire with thousands of nuclear missiles pointed at us. At the time, I was a young reporter uh, in Windsor, Ontario, working for Radio Canada. I had a great job, a nice apartment, and a boyfriend promising to marry me. But for some reason, I did not want to settle for this. I wanted to see the world, and, and Justin's idea, I thought, was the best in the world. So I packed all my belongings in six boxes. I flew to Paris, and I took a long train ride to Moscow. Going to the Soviet Union at the time was like going to the dark side of the moon. It was a place where everything was upside down. You could fly to Siberia, to the other end of the country, for around one dollar. But at the same time, you had to wait hours in line just to buy a loaf of bread or a piece of cheese. Food was really hard to find. I, I, one day I fainted in the Canadian embassy uh, simply because I hadn't eaten all day. Obviously, my living conditions were not exactly like the one I had in Windsor. I was living at Justin's place. He put me in the kitchen. There was a bed there. And at night, cockroaches would just invade the kitchen. It would just everywhere, everywhere. I, I couldn't sleep. I would open the fridge, and there they were in the fridge. Very disgusting. And they were there, super-duper Soviet cockroaches. But hey, my life over there was much richer, much more surprising than the one I had in, in Windsor. I had a lot of friends. I had a very social life. Uh, and rapidly, I found a new apartment, a beautiful place with the view of Moscow, on Moscow, um, near the Moscow Conservatory. And rapidly, I, I noticed that this whole empire was collapsing all around me. Every day brought a new crisis in a place I never heard of. New Year's Eve 1991, uh, there was this little place called Lithuania uh, on, the uh, on the Baltic Sea. At, now it's a country, but at the time it was a Soviet Republic, and the people over there wanted their independence, and they staged huge demonstrations. So, at the time, I was replacing the CBC correspondent who was on holidays, and I was in, I was in his big office in Moscow, and, and I was watching the situation in Lithuania on TV. It was unraveling, it was crazy, and, and I was like, what am I doing here? I have to go and see it with my own eyes. I have to go there. So, I dropped everything, went to the railway station, pushed my way in front of the ticket line, bought a ticket, and jumped on the next train to Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania. And the next day when I arrived, I heard of a great tragedy. Thousands of young people, a bit older than you guys, poured into the street during the night to block the Soviet soldiers advancing. The soldiers shot in the crowd and their tanks crushed 13 young people. As part of my job, I had to go and see so I went to the funeral home, and, and there they were, these 13 young men and women around my age, in a coffin, open casket. It was the first time of my life I saw people that died violently like this, in, in a context like this. Uh, I am, we are, from a country that never experienced war firsthand. We're very privileged. Your history teachers, they talk to you about wars, about revolution. But when you see repression up close, 
it shocks you. There's, you feel a sense of great injustice and you ask why? Why can't these people just talk to each other and solve their problems? Well, unfortunately, in many countries, it's not the way it works. So the next day I went to the funeral and there was a million people in the street of Vilnius, along the main street of Vilnius, a million people to watch the procession. Imagine, it was a third of the whole country. Imagine Montreal, like half the population of Montreal in the street. And there was this silence, a million people silent, mourning, while a band was playing Chopin's funeral march. I will never forget that moment. A journalist has to bear witness. I had to bear witness. I had to tell this story. If people like me, if journalists, wouldn't have told what was going on in Lithuania at the time, nobody would have known. And so, as horrific as it was, it was just a warm-up to what was coming. The Soviet Union was collapsing. People were fighting for their freedom in hope of a better life. This was the funeral a million people. And so I was drawn to these conflicts. I was hooked, hooked on wars, hooked on its intensity, on, it was the adrenaline, it was the raw side of human nature. But what struck me the most, the most amazing thing was that among war and chaos, I saw normal people people trying to struggle, to continue to survive, to feed their children, just normal people holding on to their precious life. When I was in Grozny, the city was totally destroyed. And this guy, Yevgeny, I was in the middle of the street, there was fighting everywhere. And I remember Yevgeny, he gave me shelter, he brought me in the basement of his building, and when with his wife, we waited for the fighting to come down, and he shared their few pickled tomatoes with me, and they insisted I eat, and it was the only thing they had. These guys saved my life. In places like these, you meet people, very courageous people, very generous like Yevgeny, and only for them, I wanted to tell their stories. I wanted the world to know what they were going through. And it's important that you and others read these stories just to realize that you're fortunate, that nothing should be taken for granted, not even your Nutella in the morning, your iPod, or the freedom to say whatever you want. These journalists are there to give you perspective on what's going on. They're there to explain to you the world outside our safe and orderly country. It's important because peace is fragile and the ugly face of evil is never too far. When I was covering these wars, I met poets. I met very literate people who turned into warriors and they were ready for the worst atrocities. Do you know, guys, atrocities are often planned by very intelligent people. Another thing that is very fragile, I found, was women's freedom. In 92, I was in Afghanistan, and I was there when the communists were ruling the place. And when the communists were ruling the place, of course, there was a problem, but, but when, um, women were able to work. They were doctors, engineers. They were, they were free. I mean, in the streets of Kabul, women would walk without a scarf, and from one day to the next, it totally changed. I was there when the Islamic rebel took over the city. And the next morning, there were no more women in the street. And the only women who dared go, going out that day and the days after were covered from head to toes. Stones were thrown at me just because I was wearing jeans and I didn't cover my head. So guys, I've learned that nothing should be taken for granted. Another thing I've learned when I was a war correspondent is to work as a team, is to be able to share and trust. A journalist, a war correspondent, is nothing without his or her colleague. 
you share everything. You share your notes, you share, you share transportation, food, your sound, you share your images. You are each other lifeline. You are brothers in arms and often friends for life. I had a friend, his name was Rory Peck. He was a very experienced cameraman. He covered a lot of conflicts and he gave me many advice. And, and I remember it was in 93 that the city of Moscow at the time was really on the verge of a revolution, a civil war, I would say. And, and so that day, it was crazy. There was a lot of demonstration and, and we worked like crazy. And I was having a beer with Rory and we were just reminiscing about the craziness of our job, the surreal moments, and we were laughing a lot. And he said, uh, why don't you come with us tonight? We're going to the Russian television tower. There's supposed to be things there happening. There'll be a lot of people. And I said, look, Rory, I'm, I'm really tired. I'm staying here. I'm going to go home and I'm going to work from home. And so he went. And I went home and, and sure enough, there was a lot of fighting at the television tower that night. It was very violent. And so I made a couple of phone calls or I followed it on the radio and TV and, and I filed my report and went to bed. And the next morning, I picked up my newspaper, my local newspaper, and I, I, I just, I looked on the front page and, and there was this picture with the guy. This guy had his, it was, his head was in a pool of blood and, and his camera what was on his side and, and I realized it was Rory. He died in a rocket explosion. I was sad, of course. In moments like these, you realize that even your more, most experienced friends are not immune. Hence, you are not immune. You're like anybody else, and this is a crazy job. It's a dangerous job. Last year, in 2013, for example, 70 journalists were killed, mostly in conflicts, and many of them were freelance journalists like Rory and, and me. And recently, maybe you heard, there was two American journalists that were executed in Syria after being kidnapped. One of them is Jim Foley that you see here. These people died for a cause they hold dear. I'm not a war correspondent anymore. I moved on, but this period of my life changed me forever and I will always have the greatest respect for my former colleagues. You guys may be listening to the radio in your parents' car in the morning when you go to school. Maybe you, you look you know, on the internet, maybe you scan through your news feed on, on Facebook or Twitter. Maybe you don't even bother looking at them. But now you know that these stories do not come to you by magic. There are actual real men and women in the field reporting, trying to convey the life of other people struggling through violence and wars. So guys, I hope that what I've told you today will inspire you, will, will push you to read and be curious about the world, and that now you'll listen to the news differently. Thank you. Thank you.